Thank you for joining us. Um, sorry, I apologize in advance. I'm going to have to make the presentation in English because the only French words I understand are so place en portée. And with this vocabulary, we're not going to get far at all. So really, really sorry about that. Uh, my name is Amit. I'm uh, founder and CTO of Talent.io. Uh, we are a startup that helps software engineers find amazing jobs. So if you know any software engineers looking for amazing jobs, consider letting them know about us. I would really appreciate that. And I'd like to, before Talent.io, I uh, was previous uh, founder of a, a travel company startup in the US. I founded it in 2010 and sold it to TripAdvisor three years later. Uh, and today I'd like to talk to you about, uh, or in the short amount of time that we have, the nine minutes that we have left, try to help you guys have a intuition to answering the question or a decent answer to answering the question, is my startup idea a good startup idea or not? And I want to do this through a friend of mine. I want to talk to you about a friend of mine. Uh, his name is John Beekman. And John, in 2011, was a CEO of a startup in the group gifting space. And it didn't really go very well. And he was ready to pursue his next idea. And he came up with an idea. And the idea was as following. He said, hey, it's really hard to find cool gifts for men. And I think, I really think I can transform the way that men uh, receive gifts uh, in the world. So he created a company called Mancrate. What is Mancrate? Mancrate has an innovation, a cool innovation, that instead of receiving your gift with, you know, paper wrap and all these ribbons and fluffy stuff, you're going to get a gift package like this. This is a, uh, a wooden crate that is extremely hard to open. It's sealed very, very well. It ships with a crowbar, with a pry bar. And you need to prove your manlyhood before you can get your reward by prying open the gift with the pry bar. Um, so that's his idea. Pretty cool idea, right? Cool idea. Is this a good idea, though? That's the question because companies and startups succeed and fail not because necessarily of products, but because of other things. Um, so the main message that I want you guys to take home from this very short talk is as following. Startup, validating startup ideas is not an exercise in gut feeling. It's not an exercise in business management. It's more, it more looks like an academic exercise, a scientific exercise. If I'm a scientist and I come to you and I tell you, I have a claim, I'm gonna make the following claim. Cardiologists should have longer shifts during the Euro Cup. Do you think it's a good idea? Do you think it's a reasonable claim? And you're probably gonna tell me, I don't know, like, it really depends, right? I mean, it depends on how do you, what do you base your, your, your idea on? What is this claim about? And fortunately, since the 17th century, we have a pretty interesting tool called the scientific method that tells us basically that in order to test any claim or any theory, we come up with an hypothesis, we conduct an experiment, we observe basically the data that we observe from the experiment, and then we, um, we iterate on the, on the idea until we get finally a reasonable answer. So with the cardiologist, actually, the perfect experiment is in 2006 World Cup. A team in Germany looked at the data and saw that in every single day where the German team plays, number of cardiovascular events went up dramatically more than two and a half times the average. So guys, please stay safe during this uh, Euro Cup. <laughs> but let's, let's get outside of, uh, of um, science and back to John. The reason why I'd like to talk about John is not is because John did a pretty interesting thing, uh, but I don't want to, I don't like to talk about John because of what he did. I like to talk about him because of what he did not do. John did not buy a hundred crates and a hundred pry bars and picked a couple of gifts in the market and stuff whatever it is in and sealed them shut and try to sell sell them in the market. John did not hire a professional engineer or software engineer or a professional designer. What John did instead was conducting an experiment. And the experiment had an objective. The objective was to answer the following three questions. Would people buy? For which price? And can I acquire them profitably? And he wanted to answer these questions before he had any product. The reason why these, these questions are interesting is because what we know is that almost every failed startup has a product. But most failed startups what they don't have is enough customers. And he wanted to know, can I acquire customers in a profitable manner? And can I validate that biggest risk to my execution before I can even uh, I can sell or I have any product? So what John did over a weekend, he built a website. This is his website in 2011. 
Uh, mind you, it's not 99.99, and still it looks pretty not super sharp, but it does, it does the trick. And what it did is basically um, he had a messaging. He, bought, he went to the supermarket, bought a couple of snacks, put them around the same, he had only one crate. Put them around the crate, took some photos, he had no product, right? Put some random prices, literally random prices, okay? And then used a very small budget for his experiment to drive people from Google AdWords to his site and see how they, how they convert and see whether people, what are they clicking on, and do they convert at all. Um, nope. <laughs> okay. The site, while not looking super pretty, it had everything you can imagine from an e-commerce website. It had like a product description page. You can say here, like, I want it to be delivered on a certain date. I want like to add to cart. I want to uh, check out. And he even had a, um, a checkout form, a credit card checkout form, uh, that he expected people to fill in order to consider them as converted. And this is a pretty, pretty important thing because if you go to like someone and say, would you like my crate? Probably gonna say, yeah, it's a cool idea. Would you pay 50 bucks for it? Yeah, sure, I'll pay 50 bucks for it. But until it gives you a credit card, do not believe him. Uh, and, and, and John did not. So John considered basically conversion only if people filled that credit card information. Of course, he did not actually make an order because he didn't have anything to sell. What he did, what he did do, is called him immediately after and said, hi, my name is John, I'm CEO of Mancrates. We don't have the product line yet ready to go, uh, but I do like to ask you a couple of questions. How do you find about us? What did you like about our idea? What you didn't like about the idea? Anything I should add? Any particular gifts you'd like to have, etc." He told me that he actually had a 90-year-old woman that after having a conversation, she went back and repurchased another one, and he's like, he just told her it didn't have a product, but she still didn't get it. She really wanted that idea. Uh, that, that, uh, that gift. Anyhow, that's a pretty cool validation. Uh, the experiment went very well for John. Uh, he launched the, the company as a result of that, the product, and now there are more than 30 employees in California, and they just raised last year more than $3 million, so they're doing pretty well, and uh, a company that's worth tracking in the future. Okay, now let's uh, take a step back from John, from his uh, kind of story, and talk about kind of what we're here for, which is, um, which is how to know if a startup idea is a good idea or not. So a startup idea, and here's like where I kind of want to connect it back to the hypothesis, right? the, the, to the scientific method. A startup idea is a hypothesis. The hypothesis is that if we build the product or service that we want to provide, then we'll be able to acquire customers in a profitable way or in a cheap enough way so that when we deliver that service, we can actually hopefully not lose any money in the process and potentially make actually uh, some profit. So uh, there's a lot of different ways like to actually break it down this, this very, very important question of like I have a hypothesis, how do I validate it? Well, you validate it by going through each one of the assumptions you're making on the way, putting them on, organizing them under buckets and going and testing each one of them with, uh, with appropriate experiment where of course you're gonna um, prioritize the experiments that are the highest risk or the assumptions that have the highest risk for your business first. And there's a lot of models to do this. The model that I would recommend you guys look out if you're interested is Steve Blank's business model canvas, <laughs> but uh, we don't have a lot of time, so we're gonna talk about a shorter model from IDEO, uh, which is the three lenses model, which talks about basically uh, three buckets of putting the assumptions under. First one is desirability. Would the idea, the product or service I'm selling, would, is it desirable enough for people to actually spend the money or time uh, on that product. And you see a lot of companies do very early customer discovery interviews, calls, uh, trying to basically get a, a sense of uh, how this works. And in the Q&A section, I'm happy to say how we did this uh, in my previous company or this company in talent. Uh, feasibility, whether it's even possible to actually deliver the service product that we want. And that's a pretty important question, not necessarily for consumer internet startups or internet startups in our era, but if you are going to try to, let's say, have a company, a medical device company, it's a pretty legitimate question, a pretty important problem. Is the technology even feasible? If you have, let's say, if you're going to compete against Tesla with like a new self-driving car, you probably want to have a really sharp team uh, on board. Otherwise, nobody's going to believe you can actually make it happen. Uh, and if you need some to acquire access to proprietary data, you certainly want to make sure you have that access in advance. Um, and finally, viability, whether this product or service, you can create a black box when when you invest $1 in marketing, you get more than $1 in profits out of it, which is, means that you have a, created a, a profitable, sustainable business. So I'm going to leave you with this uh, final words right on time. 10 seconds left. Uh, startup is a long-term commitment. It takes at least two years. 
Probably more than five years, even if you get funded, if you get uh, if you get lucky enough to get funded. Uh, so you really want to make sure that uh, whatever it is it that you're working on is worth your time, energy, investment, etc. You really want to make sure. So experiment. Make sure that the validations, the process is really about validating the assumptions that you're making behind this hypothesis. Uh, and if you found through experimentation that your hypotheses are invalid or assumptions are invalid, it's a very good thing because you just just prevented yourself from wasting a lot of time, and you can pivot and change direction as a result. Thank you. Thank you. Si vous avez des questions et que vous voulez pas les poser en anglais, on peut les traduire. Yep. Yeah. You mentioned another model, the one. Yes, the name is uh, Business Model Canvas by Steve Blank. C. Blank is a pioneer kind of lean startup. He created lean startup way before uh, Eric Chris. Eric Chris was actually a student. Uh, Stan actually. Eric Chris was actually a student. Um, and and C. Blank is a is a very well known uh, mentor guru in this space. Uh, and one of the things that he created his first book, The Four Steps to Epiphany, was absolutely unreadable. Uh, highly recommend it. Everybody try to read it, but it's very unreadable. Uh, the the second book, the, the book, one of the books that he has, uh, talks about this. You can find it online. It's very easy. It splits, I think, to nine or so buckets all the assumptions, you can go through and answer each one of the individual questions uh, to see basically if you made the assumption, if you ticked all the boxes before you actually go and start investing in your company. Yep. Uh, could you tell us what is the story behind Talent.io, like how you validate uh, validated your model? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the question was, can I talk a little bit about Talent.io and the story there? Uh, so um, Talent.io basically came up from a real big need that we felt uh, from a previous company. So I had a, a, a chance to work with an exceptional person in, uh, in my previous company called Nicolas Mounier, who is today the CEO of Talent.io. Uh, we met in, uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, we went to a school together there. Uh, and after we, um, uh, we basically, after we sold our first company, we started thinking, okay, what's the next company? What's the next idea? And we really had a big pain point in our previous company, CruiseWise, uh, which was an online cruise booking agency, uh, of finding great engineers. And the interesting thing is that from an engineer standpoint, I think it's a really exciting time to be a software engineer these days. Because there's so many opportunities out there, so many cool startups doing really great stuff. Really, I mean, software transforms the world right now that we live in. And it's really exciting time to be a software engineer. At the same time, as a result of that, there's so many opportunities out there, you can really get, you know, feel lost sometimes about when you want to switch for a job. You know, how do I, uh, how do I, um, how do I know where to start? So the idea was, uh, creating basically Talent.io is a platform that allows you a software engineer to just register, right? And save you a lot of time and headache because we have a lot of companies there in the marketplace in the, in basically on the, that, that are signed up, that are clients, and they can see profiles, see profiles of, 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 of software engineers, exceptional talent that signed up, and come to you and give you the offers before basically... Um, uh, so basically, yeah. you build a platform before uh, like validating the model, like making sure people would, uh, would try it. Would so, so what we did, okay, so back to the, to the basically validation question. We had a hypothesis that basically candidates would love us. That's a pretty big hypothesis, right? I mean, you know, we need to prove it. I mean, yes, I can say, I can talk to you all about this, how great it is, but I need to prove it. So I need to make sure that we can actually find... Uh, people that uh, that would like to uh, to sign up, and the companies would love us and find it really, really, uh, really great and easy. So we did actually from a previous learning from a previous company. My previous company, Cruisewise, it took us about a year to build a product. I do not recommend taking that long. You can do it much, much uh, faster. In this case, we took about uh, three weeks. So I would say pretty, pretty fast. Um, we hired um, the first employees before we had a product which gave us a really hard deadline. And we said, okay, your deadline is by uh, March 15, 2015. We have the first time where companies and candidates are going to interact on the platform. And that's our deadline. And no matter what happens, that's what we're going to have to make, right? So, so um, I think it was much, much shorter to actually validate this time and build something which we weren't proud of in the beginning because it didn't, you know, it was, uh, it was a very kind of, we put it really, really quickly, but it was something that we used to validate very quickly the idea. So as soon as we started making the first phone calls to customers, to clients, companies, we got a lot of yeses. And I was kind of like, wow, that's interesting. That's pretty cool. And then uh, we started talking to, uh, to potential candidates, to people that would like to, to software engineers. And we got a lot of yeses and said, that's pretty cool. And then we had the first session in March 15. And in the first uh, 
two weeks, we already have a lot of interest between uh, companies and uh, software engineers. We said, that is really interesting. Let's grow this as fast as we can, and let's see if we can get it to scale. And this is, you know, the rest is kind of uh, is our growth curve right now, which is uh, we are, we are uh, I would say, the, the fastest growing uh, marketplace in, in Europe at the moment, uh, which is very, we're very proud to, uh, to say that. Um, so, yeah, does that answer your question about validation? Yeah. Yes. What, why did you start Talent Are you in France, not in the Valley? So there's a lot of things. That's a great question. Uh, so in the Valley, uh, we basically, there was a, an existing company that did, something, that did something similar. We wanted to basically differentiate by going to a market which uh, did not exist yet. We, Talent.io is purely European, not US. It's a European uh, uh, recruitment platform, I would say, or job-seeking platform. So we want to differentiate on geography. Uh, and we had a really amazing opportunity. So Nico, Nico is uh, French, uh, is French originally. So obviously, he wanted to go back to France. I have a personal reason of going back with my girlfriend to uh, to Europe as well. Uh, so it's all just like mashed up. And then we also found a really incredible um, guy uh, called uh, that that's established a really big and, and successful and and likable agency. Probably one of the only likable agencies in France uh, called Urban Linker. Um, and uh, basically, together we just you know, uh, joined forces and did it. So we had, it was a mix of a lot of opportunities uh, that, that basically we, uh, as a result of that, we decided to start. And I'm a, I would say, a testament that as a foreigner, non-French speaking, I don't speak a word of French, or maybe three, uh, you can actually, you can actually make it uh, work. And I'm, I'm really happy here. It's going really, really well. And I'd like to stay here and also and uh, continue pursuing this business. Last question. Last question. Yes. So what would be the lessons that you tell yourself if you could go back in time to when you started your first startup? So what were the learnings that... <laughs> I could probably give like a maybe 30 minutes conversation about, about learning. <laughs> most key points. Yeah. Uh, I would say the first, the most important lesson is, is basically go to market as uh, quickly as possible to validate your idea. That's the number one lesson, full stop. There's a lot of other lessons about how to think about when to raise money from whom, etc. I would say that um, when, uh, from raising money standpoint, which is another really big take takeaway from me, uh, raise money um, from if you go institutional to like raising VCs, etc. Make sure you do this in a time where it already matches your growth curve and not before that. Don't try to prematurely, I would say, get um, uh, institutional money um, into your startup. Because that was that was a challenge that we had to face uh, at my previous company. Happy to talk about this in another talk, maybe another time, but lesson.